Okay, we're back. We're live on Think Tech Talks, Community Matters, with Art Souza, who is the Complex Area Superintendent for the Department of Education right. on the Big Island. Correct. May I say, the Hawaii Island. Hawaii Island. Hawaii Island, Island yeah. You've got to keep current on <laughs> those things. Thank you very much for being here, Art. Oh, thanks, Jay. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's going Good to be to great to examine. You know, I really love the Big Island. It's, yeah. Uh, you know, it's the finest expression of Hawaii in terms of diversity, climate, topography, mm -hmm. all those things. It's, it's a joy to be there. I have to get there soon again. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, absolutely a unique place. Great yeah. place to work, great place to be a superintendent. So how did you get to be a superintendent? Well, the route is what most educators in the state of Hawaii do. I started as a school teacher. My first job was working in alternative education in the Kali Palama complex. Worked with uh, in alienation programs and eventually um, after working in independent schools for a bit, um, moved to the Big Island and became an English teacher at Honoka High School and uh, moved into education, uh, educational administration from that point as a vice principal at a couple of schools. Eventually I became principal at Waikolo Elementary School and then back to Honoka as a high school principal and into this position for the last nine years. So you came from Oahu? I did. I grew up here in the Liliha Palama area yeah. and moved up uh, with my family, uh, but it's been about 25, 26 years now. That must have been something. If I do my math right, that's that's going to be in the late 80s. Yeah, yeah, it was and the late 80s. Um, I said it was a good time for us to go. You know, I had um, done a lot of good work here in Oahu, but we were looking for some place uh, a little more rural, uh, maybe a little quieter place to start raising a family. So that was a lot of what made the decision for us to move there. What a, what a difference between the, all the action in, in Honolulu. And yeah, Honoka, Honoka, it, it, Honoka is just a beautiful place. Yeah, extraordinary place. Yeah. It's an exciting time to be there too because the uh, Honoka community had just gone through the closure of the sugar plantation. Yes, it was right around then. Yeah. Right around that time, so uh, it was uh, challenging and trying times to to be at school, but at the same time, um, um, a chance to really start to foster uh, a change process that an entire community was going to have to go through. So I think I got a good uh, running start on understanding change and the elements of change. Yeah, and, cha and knowing the Big Island and is a special place. Absolutely, sure. yeah. absolutely. So from there now, um, you're the uh, superintendent of the, what they call the complex area, which right. runs all the way from Hamakua to Milolii, huh? That's correct. It's west to Hawaii, so if you can envision the island of Hawaii and you cut it almost in half at, with Pawilo, um, an area about, oh, what's Pauilo, about 10 miles east of Honoka'a. That's my complex area from Pauilo through Honoka'a, up through North Kohala, up to Habi, and then all the way down through Central Kona and through South Kona down to uh, Ho'okena. Correct. Huge. Huge area. I, I would say the heart of Hawaii lives there, don't you think? The heart of Hawaii lives in, in, in West Hawaii. Hawaii, yeah, you yeah, got yeah, it. Yeah, it's fantastic place. Yeah, it's, it's all the elements you can imagine. Very, It's rural, but yet and there are cosmopolitan areas, you know, central Kona, um, the area around north Kona, the Kealakehi area that's growing, you know, with the big box stores. So it's a changing kind of uh, mindset and environment there. And it's flanked by rural areas in the north and the farming communities and coffee communities in the south. So there's a little bit of everything, yeah. Changing the operative word. So changes the operative. The time you got there till now, you've seen extraordinary changes yeah. all through that area. No? Yeah, we've seen changes. I think not only educationally, but certainly um, demographically. We've seen an influx of uh, a huge uh, migrant population, uh, Marshallese population, and of course, uh, in the financial sector and the economic sector, um, the areas of growth in the state are in West Hawaii. So tremendous change, tremendous dynamics. Just for perspective, just a short recollection. When I when I first came to Hawaii, which was in the 60s, I remember reading in the paper that Twig Smith and some of mm -hmm. his friends decided they wanted to walk the ridge line. Maybe it was the 70s. Walk the <laughs> ridge line of the mountains from north to south mm -hmm. on the Big Island, and there were areas there then that had no electricity. Yeah, the Big yeah. Island was really yeah. remote in those days. Yeah, yeah that's that's. That's something, yeah. I, 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 I'm trying to make make connection between that then and now, and you know we still have kids who live off the grid, so it's it's uh, there's still elements of that. Yeah. So um, especially when you get down south and in, in some of our most challenged areas down, um, uh, the below, southwest, yeah, right? below Hokena and the Honolulu Hokena areas. Yeah. You know we've got there are challenges that people live with in that yeah. regard. In the same so way, so that, that gives you challenges. It does. You got to manage the school yeah. district and. So what, you know, can you tell me what a complex 
district is, a complex area mm -hmm. is, and uh, how does this area differ from others in the state? Well, a complex area basically is conditioned to include the elementary school, the middle school, and the high school. It's a feeder pattern. Okay. And we have four of those. So in Honoka, it would be it would include the Honoka schools as well as Waimea and Pa'awilo. And then, of course, Kohala has a very fluid, complex structure because it's one elementary, one middle, and one high school. So there are no transitions with other schools. And then we have the same kind of uh, situation in North Kona, where you have the Kealakehi schools and Kahakai Elementary and Holuoloa, which feed into Kealakehi High School. And then in South Kona, the feeder schools go into Kona High School. So that's what a complex pattern is, and what we're trying to do is create that K-12 structure across mm -hmm, the complex. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So what kind of student body can you sort of give me a handle of, on the way you see the sort of the special character of the student body in this district? Well, I think the special character of the, of the student body is that they're really good rural kids, kids who are attached and connected to the land. And because of that, they learn in place-based ways. So unlike kids who might be a little more sophisticated, uh, a little more worldly in the urban areas, you have kids who maybe are not quite so. Um, our schools are all Title I schools, which mean that under the federal poverty guidelines, they qualify as low-income poverty area schools. So that's a challenge for us because it, w what comes with that, of course, is resource, um, resource shortages a lot of times. What does that mean? Well, basically, um, the families are living below the poverty line. Okay. and so. Uh, the kids coming to school may not come equipped with as much of the, um, uh, for lack of a better expression, maybe the paraphernalia that kids in, in more affluent areas come with. Yeah. Um, uh, our geographic areas create a, a challenge, of course, because um, uh, our kids have to get back and forth on buses. So uh, transportation is an issue. Uh, additional challenges for us right now are the demographics are changing dramatically with the influx of these migrant folks that I've talked about, the migrant populations, the Marshallese kids. And they come, a lot of these youngsters with particular learning styles and learning needs. Um, uh, we have a large ELL, second language population, Spanish speaking youngsters who are up in our farm lots areas in the north and a lot of the uh, Marshallese youngsters who are settling there as well as in South Kona. I think um, one of our largest professional challenges in West Hawaii is just this notion of teacher um, recruitment and transition and, 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 uh, and the, the result that a lot of times teachers are in and out, so there's a temporary nature to some of our school settings. Um, and we're working on that, we're trying to create a... Tell me about that. I mean, well, well what's, the, what's the body of teachers like, as opposed to other areas, districts in the state? How, how does it differ to the extent it does? And uh, tell me about this, this in and out process. Well, I think a lot of our, our, our teachers tend to be community-based. So if you're a teacher in Honoka, you probably, for a large measure, live in the Honoka Waimea area. Same would be for, it's true of Kohala. But we have teacher shortages, and so there's a large recruitment effort yearly in our, in our instance in West Hawaii trying to get teachers to fill vacant positions. Um, in years past, we've had as many as 70 to 75 to 80 vacancies. That's quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, when you Out of a total of how many? Of about 1,000 teachers. So, you know, you're coming up around somewhere on 8 9% turnover. So it's a challenge. Uh, we've had some good fortune in the last few years to work, work with Teach for America, and they've, uh, pro they, they've provided us with um, uh, a source of young, energetic, eager teachers who've come in and are able to fill those gaps. But it's temporary in nature because their commitment is for a two-year period. So we'd like to keep more of these folks on, not only Teach for America, but uh, young, young, young people, but we need to just do a better job, I think, of mining our youth to make sure that we get uh, quality teachers coming out yeah, of the teacher yeah. colleges. Where do they come from, generally? Are they, are they all from UH Manoa or somewhere else? We get teachers um, from UH Manoa, but uh, the University of Hawaii at Hilo has done a really good job. I think they have an excellent teacher's college there. And so we've had really, really good luck working with the teacher, uh, um, uh, the teacher program, training program there. And we have people coming out of the Hilo College. Art Souza, uh, the complex area superintendent on the Big Island, make that Hawaii Island. Hawaii Island, <laughs> West Hawaii. <laughs> West Hawaii. Uh, and we're here on uh, Think Tech Hawaii uh, Community Matters, so we'll take a short break. We'll be right back. We want to thank our underwriters. Hawaiian Electric Company and its affiliates Maui Electric on Maui and Hawaii Electric Light Company on Hawaii Island are deeply committed to the communities they serve. Galen Ho is a senior executive of BAE Systems, a global defense, security, and aerospace company. The High Tech Development Corporation, 
the state's leading technology agency, attached to the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism. Castle in Cook, Hawaii, with a time-honored legacy that spans more than 160 years and revolves around its mission of investing in Hawaii, creating communities, and providing for the needs of our state. Hawaii Gas, formerly the gas company, a proponent of the liquefied natural gas initiative, helping Hawaii achieve its transition to clean energy and a better energy future. Collateral Analytics, a Hawaii-based tech company empowering the real estate industry with greater and faster access to the tools and data they need to make better informed property investment decisions. I'm Nicole Horry. Thanks so much for joining us on ThinkTech. I'm Maria Kashem. See you next time. We're back, we're live, we're here on Think Tech uh, Talks uh, on Community Matters, specifically with Art Souza, who is the Complex Area Superintendent uh, for Hawaii Island. And we're talking about education on Hawaii Island. It's just a really interesting mm -hmm. thing to talk about. You know, because so often in our state, you know, I call it insular drift. You know, people on one island, they don't follow what goes on on the other island. They're yeah. focused on their own island. And so I think we need to focus on other islands. My own focus is I love the big island. I think I told you my wife and I had a home in Habi for, right, for right. 15 years. Right. And we loved it. We loved the people. We loved the way of the way style of life. And we, we saw some of the things that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyway, uh, so I'd, I'd like to know about, it comes to mind, I, uh, I'm interested in the Internet. Mm -hmm. And you spoke of, uh, you know, kids that come from families that are not, that are not, uh, that are below the poverty line. Um, did they have access at home to the internet? What, what, and and what does that mean in terms of treating them as, uh, you know, as students? Yeah. Well, you know, if we're going to really prepare kids for the 21st century world and the the global economy, we're going to have to be living in. Technology has to play a key. It's a it's a grounding principle. It's it's foundational. I think more and more we're seeing that our families do have access to uh, computers, do have access to internet. It's 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 much much more than we could have thought it would have been like yeah, ten years ago. Certainly, true. I think one of our struggles is so many of our schools are really old, and our facilities are 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 in large measures. Um, uh, buildings that sometimes date back to the 30s, 40s, and 50s. So a lot of times some of our older buildings don't carry the infrastructure needed to have real high-end upgrade and um, high-tech stuff that we need for the kids. Um, simple things like do we have enough electricity to carry the computer labs. So those are tra challenges. But more and more we're seeing that um, the computer is a part of everyone's life. So our families are, are, are equipped. Yeah, good. Well, yeah. That's, that's really important because it's it's a tool that allows them, you know, to touch the yeah, world absolutely, everywhere. You know, absolutely. Be from a small town, yeah. but you're a global citizen. So. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, how many students are there, in, you know, in total in the in the uh, in the complex area? We have about eleven thousand five hundred students, and as I mentioned earlier, about a uh, thousand teachers. Um, and again, diverse population of kids. Um, with a, a growing ELL population, that's one of our focus areas. Yeah, I want to ask you about that. I mean, how do you? Do you have to make special arrangements to teach English as a second language? Do you, do, you, uh, do you have to bring in teachers or train them to do this, or is it you know, sort of inherent in, 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 in the ability of a teacher to teach? You know, um, there are not a lot of people coming out of teacher preparation programs who necessarily have English second language degrees. So a lot of our teachers acquire the skills by taking coursework, doing in-service and professional development. but. Relative, believe it or not, relatively few are necessarily credentialed in uh, ELL um, um, in the ELL field. So we've engaged in pretty aggressive professional development, not only for specific teachers but for all of our faculties, because we find that the best strategies and the best practice teaching methods um, that you would use on a second language learner are applicable to all kids. They're just good basic teaching strategies. So we've taken a kind of global approach to mm -hmm. them. Um, I'm particularly excited, though, that um, what we've been able to do most recently is really start working with community organizations, community groups, uh, social agencies to develop community-based programs in support of the English language learners. That uh, so not only are they getting supports. Uh, in the academic arena in schools, but they're getting those social tutorial supports, the acculturation supports in the community as well. It's, it's, 
it's, it's becoming a nice, nice partnership between community and school. That's great. Yeah. When you say community, you mean at home or in some community structure that's not necessarily at home? Within the community structure. So you'd be working with governmental agencies, for, for example, the Department of uh, Social Services, uh, Child Protective Agencies, the Hawaii Police Department. You might be working with uh, some of the um, merchants in the community. But it's to create a larger structure so that what we're doing is, is providing supports for families in the larger context of education. Yeah, I mean, families, it's, it's just so interesting. I'm, I mean, I, I don't think it's limited to, the, uh, to b the Big Island, but you really want families to back up the education of their kids, to yeah. remind them to do their homework, yeah. silly things like that. Right, but, absolutely. Uh, are you getting that in this district, uh, or, or is there a lack? You know, it, that's, a, that's a constant challenge, that, that notion of um, uh, public engagement and um, parental support and uh, direct uh, parental um, uh, dealings with the school. More often than not, you know, it happens when there's a problem. Mm -hmm. But uh, we're getting much better at it. I, I would just, I just have to say we're not any different, I think, from any of the school anywhere. It's a work in progress. Mm -hmm. This notion of how do we better engage community, how do we get com uh, a larger body of parental support in our schools, it's, it's an ongoing effort. So what, you know, taking the, uh, the whole apparatus <clears throat> of the uh, Department of Education and what the what the state provides school systems, you know, school districts all over. Uh, what you know, what are the challenges that you have that may be different? Uh, what are the what are the benefits you have that may be different uh, in this area, in the educational process? I mean, what's it like to teach a child in this area? You know, <clears throat> that's. And that's a question that can be answered in so many ways. I, you know, I alluded to some of the challenges that we have, um, but they're challenges that are are not unique to my area. They would be challenges that would be, to be anywhere. Uh, would be unique anywhere. Yeah. And of course, there are challenges in urban areas that I don't even deal with. There, the challenge is a, is a larger one. I I think the biggest challenge, you know, Jay, for education this, these days is just this notion of changing and coming in, coming to grips with making education relevant and modern. You know, in other walks of life, it seems to me that people change as society asks them to change. In the economic world, in the banking world, in the hospital, in the medical profession, the airline industry. But education, you know, has stayed relatively the same for decades. And so there's a national referendum around education right now, which is all about change. And with the establishment of the Common Core, I think we're asking our schools to do something differently. Uh, we're asking our schools to convert classrooms from a place where they've been, um, a, a place where we have kids doing the work and providing them with the work they have to do, to now making classrooms a place where kids are thinking about what they're doing and making their own learning and making their own meaning. It's a national, a national change. It's, it's a national discussion and I think the role of the educator changes dramatically because um, no longer is the teacher asked to just simply be the dispenser of knowledge, but rather to step back and let the kids create the learning and facilitate that learning. Um, we live in a world where kids have access to information instantaneously that uh, you know, that maybe the doesn't, teacher doesn't know. <laughs> or, 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 or maybe a, a range of knowledge that the teacher's not able to dispense in one 45 minute period. So I think we have to change the nature of what the classroom is and uh, give the kids more opportunity to make sense of the learning and create their own learning. That's, that's kind of where I, I really believe the challenge is, is how do we transform education into a different kind of experience for kids? How? Money? Well. You know, resources don't hurt, but you know, <laughs> realistically, there'll never be enough money for education. Yeah, is that you know? true? We'll, yeah, we'll no be what, no what it is. we'll be it's arguing that point till the cows come home. <laughs> but I, I think it's not about money. I think I really, I really don't. I, I really think it's more about us as professionals um, understanding the need that we have to change first, change our practice, take maybe a little different look at how we work with kids, and um, engage more people in the process. Uh, uh, it, it was my example of the community-based ELL supports. You know, schools cannot simply do it by themselves. We have to engage communities. We have to have the um, support of the larger sector because we're all about doing the same work. It's about supporting, enhancing, and pr providing for kids. You know, and it, it, it raises a um, you know a question in my mind about uh, how you continue, how you motivate teachers to have the same <clears throat> way of looking at it. Uh, to have them recognize the changes that are happening, to have them change to meet the circumstances, to have them be better teachers every day. 
uh, in a school district this big, how, how do you uh, make sure that happens? You know, I think it's keeping the message alive in people's minds about why we do the work, trying to streamline the focus so that the, the, the entire commitment, the moral imperative, if you wish, is about the kids. But you know, it's not hard to motivate teachers. I don't have to motivate teachers because these are people who go into the profession because they're skilled and they want to do the best thing for kids. I think teachers are amongst the most motivated people there are in any sector of work. I think they also right now are dealing with a lot of challenges and so that motivation sometimes is challenged by the frustration they feel in terms of how do I do this best. But it's part of the process of us trying to learn together and um, I, I truly believe that um, uh, we're going we're gonna to improve our schools if we really support our teachers, provide the professional means for those teachers to do the work, best work they can. Yeah. And the translation is that our kids are going to benefit for, from it. You know, it just flashed into my mind that uh, I, I ran into a woman named Laura Dierenfeld. Yeah. You know her? Yeah. yeah. She's a trust officer now for one of the, one of the big trusts. Um, a CEO for one of the trusts, actually. And uh, she, she, she told us about her program in cycling in Kamawela. Yeah. And, uh, and we, we actually made a movie of this. Really? <laughs> yeah, back when. And uh, what struck me was that these, you know, these kids were, they, they lived in rural areas, and so you have to get out. It's, yeah. it's rural is, means you have to get out to mm -hmm. enjoy the environment. And I just wonder, you know, whether, whether that's part of the curriculum, whether you have programs that take them out, take them on cycle trips the way Lauren <laughs> Dierenfeld was teaching them to do, and yeah. so forth. And we go fishing, whatever it is. Does it happen? Yeah, it does. Laura's a great person. I've worked with her for years. She used to do the bike ed programs in a lot yeah. of schools. And I remember when I was principal at uh, Waikoloa, we had them come down a couple of times a year, and they had kids bicycling all over campus. Mm -hmm. and, and then she's done a lot of work with trails and byways. Um, and yeah, we, uh, you know, um, a lot of our education we're trying to do with kids is about the environment, about sustainability. And you can only do so much of that in a classroom. You've got to get the kids in the real environment. Yeah. So we're trying to do more and more of that kind of thing. But those are the kinds of programs that are challenged by the shortage of fiscal resources. Mm. Um, um, but those are the kinds of programs that make for the, the whole world for kids. And, you know, certainly every educator you talk to these days will tell you that some of those kinds of programs have had to be uh, uh, the process and part of the funding cuts. So yeah. things like um, um, uh, offerings in, 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 in arts and drama, music and culture are probably fewer in schools than they may have been in years past. Um, and I think in my way of thinking, we have to try to find a way to get back more to that. Yeah. Because that holistic learning experience is what we want for our kids. Yeah. I, I'm reminded also of a woman named Fumiko Wellington. She's a violinist with the uh, Hawaii Symphony Orchestra mm -hmm. now. Actually, she's been with the orchestra for, forever. And her father came to Hawaii in the 50s, and she remembers uh, life in school in the 50s in Hawaii. This music was the biggest thing going. Everyone was involved in music. I mean, it was a musical life for all of them. And I, you know, uh, I sense that uh, that's not necessarily the case these days. And it's one of those things we have to get back to, because it's so, you know, deep in the in the Hawaii thing, in the yeah. Hawaii uh, culture to have music all around. That is, and, uh, it is. And you know, again, kids learn in different ways, and yeah. so that's what we're trying to get at. But you know, I, I really have such great, great hopes for what we're doing in education because the transforming, the transform the transformative process that we're through in the Department of Education now is really the most encouraging and most important thing that I've been involved with I think in my 30 plus years as an educator and I think our Race to the Top initiative and our singular focus on what we're trying to do to um, bump up expectations for ourselves as professionals and for our kids as learners it's, it's, it's mountainous work but it's work that we're achieving and um, I think um, as we get better at that, we're going to get better at um, understanding how we can incorporate that in the other disciplines as well. Yeah. I'm going to take a short break. Sure. Here. Art Souza, the Complex Area Superintendent on the Big Island, west side of the, of the Big Hawaii Island. Uh, we're talking about uh, uh, the new education on, the, on Hawaii Island here on Think Tech uh, Talks, and uh, we're, we're in Community Matters. We'll be right back after the short break. Aloha. I'm Nicole Horry for Think Tech. For nearly half a century, the Hawaii Foreign Trade Zone No. 9 has brought the benefits of the Foreign Trade Zone program to Hawaii businesses and entrepreneurs. 
DBET, the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism, operates Hawaii's Foreign Trade Zone program to encourage international business and economic development. The Foreign Trade Zone's mission is to increase the amount of international trading activity in Hawaii, thereby providing employment opportunities for the residents of our island state. For more information, see ftz9.org. I'm Nicole Hori. Mahalo. We're back, we're live, we're at Think Tech Talks, uh, Community Matters, here with Art Souza, who's the Complex Area Superintendent on the Hawaii Island. And we're talking about education on Hawaii Island today with Art, who's in for the day. Thank, Thank you, you for sir. being here, Good to Art. be here. <laughs> and we are broadcasting from Pioneer Plaza, the core of downtown Honolulu. <laughs> That's what they tell me. <laughs> so, you know, looking at education here in Oahu, as, as we do, uh, there's this big tension about uh, trying to train kids to stay or train them to go. And uh, I don't know, it's a, everybody has a different view of it and different families see it different ways. And everybody, uh, you know, regrets that so many kids leave. Uh, they want them to stay, but then, you know, the question is how do you make them stay? How do you yeah. encourage them to stay? And I take it the same tension exists on the Big Island. Yeah, certainly it does. Um, I remember a conversation I was having with um, former Big Island Mayor Harry Kim at a we were at a at the uh, Ehunui uh, Hawaiian Immersion School graduation. I was having this conversation with him a few years ago, and and I asked him, "What do you think of the the, the biggest challenge in education?" Is and I remember uh, Mayor Kim said at the time, "Exactly that. Our kids go away and they don't come home." And and I guess Jay that. The Big Island is no different than any, anywhere else because we want our kids to go and explore, see the larger world. Our kids come from small rural communities. They need to see what's out there. Uh, they need to experience life away from their homes. They need to have access to education if they so choose in another environment. But gosh, we have to do a better job of building an infrastructure and having them come back. They have to. Uh, and that's really that larger community discussion around education. Uh, are we building the opportunities for kids, the opportunities uh, beyond the resorts on our coast, which offer yeah. wonderful opportunities for our kids in certain areas, and the hotel and tourism industry in, on, uh, in West Hawaii is uh, par none. It's excellent, and our kids benefit from that, but we have to have more. Um, and so opportunities with the 30-meter telescope that's been built is encouraging opportunities around ocean ocean management and um, mining the OTEC off the coast. Um, we have to do more of these kinds of things, but it, it's it's the engagement again with the community. We have to build that infrastructure so our kids do have something to come back to. Yeah, what well, it's interesting because education is so important to being able to live in a remote area. For example, if I know more about farming. I can do farming in my backyard. Right, right. If I knew more about uh, ele electricity and energy, I can do a better job right. in clean energy and on and on and on. So it's, it's not necessarily a money. Uh, aquaponics is a perfect yep. example of yep. that. Uh, if, I, so if I have a little education in these areas. So is there a community college around? Do you do it in the high school? I mean, sometimes it surprises me how much goes on in high schools yeah. that didn't go on in high schools when I went to high school. Yeah, <laughs> yeah all our high schools have what we call career technical education programs, and um, we have programs um, built around construction academies and agriculture to do those kinds of things. Um, with the with the new um, West Hawaii Community College campus that's coming out of the ground at Palamanui, right above the airport, we see tremendous opportunities to do more of exactly what you're talking about uh, in partnership with our schools. We'll have that opportunity. Um, so yeah, you're right. Um, uh, more career opportunities tied to um, the, the curricular offerings we can give in schools is, is where we want to go. Yeah, and you know, West Hawaii is 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 a my gosh, I mean, it, it's, it's, a, it's a garden of opportunity in terms of ocean research, uh, agriculture, wind energy, um, ocean management, culinary arts. I mean, there's a lot there for kids, yeah. but it's not as developed as it needs to be. Yeah, yeah. And if it's mm -hmm. more developed, then they have you know, decent jobs waiting for them. And they don't have to, uh, you know, think about it. You know, I think when people people see kids, uh, you know, growing up in a remote area, uh, they don't realize that kids growing up in a remote area have the same ideas about seeing the world. You know, there's no reason why one of your graduates can't go to, you know, London. That's right. <laughs> you know, it's okay. Right. It works. Yeah. It happens. Yeah. Uh, and I, you know, I just, uh, you know, I, I wonder if there's, um, you know, there's something that we can all do 
and this is all the schools in the states, to, to uh, in the state to have these kids leave and then come back. Just as you said, mm -hmm. uh, a way to make a soft landing so that they can see the world, or go to China, whatever it is, and then come back and find a soft landing here for their lives. Yeah. Well, it really boils down, doesn't it, Jay, to just giving kids hope and opportunity. Yeah. And if the youngster goes away and chooses to make that his or her life, then that's okay too, because we've done a good job in our schools to prepare them for that life. Yeah, yeah. But I would just hope that should that child, that youngster want to come back and reestablish his or her roots and develop her family or his family structure here, that we have that opportunity for them. Um, I struggle with that myself. I have a son who lives in Portland, and I hope someday he comes back. I'm not sure that that's going to happen. Um, in his field of, uh, of interest, uh, we don't really have that kind of uh, infrastructure here, but maybe someday. What kinds of, uh, you know, I'm sure you've seen it all in terms of the development of the, uh, of the physical plant of the schools, um, of the teaching, you know, generations and generations of teachers mm -hmm. and generations of students and all that. What would you, what would you point at as the uh, you know, most uh, profound changes that have happened in your time over there? Oh, gosh. Uh, well, obviously, you would point immediately to technology. Um, schools are markedly different. Uh, technology has changed the way we teach. Um, um, that would be one that comes immediately to mind. But again, you know, I think the heart of education lies in the heart of the educator. And um, that hasn't changed. If anything, I think there's a deeper commitment on the part of educators to young people because they see the needs is greater. Um, so I would say that, Jay, um, um, and the need, of course, for us, um, the, the, the great change you talk about, I, I feel like we're, we're still on the treadmill trying to catch up to that. Mm -hmm. um, but we're making, we're, we're, making, we're making progress. For example, I mean, <clears throat> oh, a few months ago we did a little movie about Mid-Pack Mid mm -hmm. Institute, and then right now we're doing a movie about Iolani School. Mm -hmm. And in both cases there's a common denominator, and that is that they have they have changed the physical structure. It costs plenty of money to do this. They changed the physical structure of their classroom buildings so that they're, they're, work, they're work modules. Yeah. And the teachers and, uh, are become consultants. They become, yeah. uh, you know, they're in a, in a group. Yeah. And then the, the group comes and goes, and everybody talks to each other on a fairly egalitarian level. And the teachers merely, yeah. you know, advise them in which direction to go, and and it's it's modular so that they can be here or here or here. I see groups change yeah. all this, uh, and I wonder if that is possible. It absolutely in the is. Public system. Yeah. It absolutely is. And what you're referencing is what I was talking about a little earlier was the changing role in the look of the classroom, which yeah. changes the role in the look of the teacher. Yeah. We were really we're fortunate in our department because we have a very forward-thinking um, facilities manager, uh, Ray LaRue, who has been working with um, DAGs and the people who build schools. And they have new uh, 21st century designs for schools exactly that way. And so there is going to be one coming out of the ground. I think the, the newest school that they're building, Ray was just talking about it with us uh, a couple of weeks ago, is out in the Eva Plain. Mm -hmm. And it will be built exactly that way. So it, it, it's to, um, to create a building, a facility, that really fosters that kind of 21st century collaboration. It is a physical thing. It is a physical so you thing. You build it that way. Absolutely, yeah. it's a physical thing. Um, but in the end, physical building aside, I don't care what it looks like, I don't know how much <laughs> fancy equipment you have, it's that singular individual, it's that teacher who's going to yeah. carry the day for, that, yeah. for those kids. Yeah. And so, I, again, it's that investment in our people that is really going to make the difference for us. The thing about education, I'm sure you've seen this over your whole career, is that you got to have a, a, a special relationship with every kid. Like you can't profile them. Absolutely. You can't, you know, make general characterizations about them. You got to have it's one on one, yep. and in that way you get inside them as human beings, and then you bring out the That's best. Right. And so you have teachers and, like that. You know, and on our campuses, everybody has to be a teacher. I remember the story I would tell was when I was a principal at White Columbia some years ago, and we we're having we were just struggling with this one youngster who just we just couldn't make the kind of connections we wanted for, for this youngster in the classroom. But he, some, for one reason, that he resonated with our, our head custodian. And so we created, an, we created opportunities for him to spend time with a custodian in a work, um, work internship kind of situation. And it, 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 it turned him to a point where he was able to get into school. What a great thing. It's a great story. Yeah. But it, it just taught me a whole lot about this notion of the importance of a meaningful adult. Yeah. So it's, 
yes, it's the classroom teacher, but it's also the custodian, it's the cafeteria worker, it's the clerks in the office. Everybody shares a part in the lives of these kids and what you have to do to make it work for these youngsters. It's a whole ecosystem. It is. It's an ecosystem. <laughs> and, and the kid comes into the, uh, the school and um, everything around Absolutely. him is pointing it to the right way. And, Absolutely. Absolutely. And you've been able to achieve that. We're working on it. <laughs> you know, one thing that I know about uh, education, it's a work in progress. You, you never get to the finish line because there's always more to do. Yeah. And you can always do it better. Yeah. Because kids deserve that much more. They deserve that much better. So, you know, um, I keep that in mind. Um, and we talk about that a lot with our principals and our teachers is what can we do to, to, to make it better for kids? What do we have to, how do we have to get better to do that? Yeah. And that's kind of the mantra. Yeah. Well, let me uh, let me ask about the future for a minute. Sure. Um, you know what what big projects uh, are going on right now, and what projects do you see happening in the future? What changes in methodology and systems do you see? You know, to further improve the area. Well, one of the things that we've been working on in West Hawaii for for a number of years now, since I've been a superintendent, is this notion of. Um, um, well, it's a three-pronged notion of we want to close the achievement gap, so we have to have special programming in place for our most challenged youth. We have to, it's a matter of equity for me, we have to balance the playing field, we have to give everyone that opportunity to succeed. So special programming to meet the needs of those challenged youngsters. The second thing is the development of what I call a K-12 construct. You know, for so long we've worked in this idea of episodic brilliance where we have one school at a time that's very good that might sit within a complex of schools that aren't so good. So we have to develop a construct or a management system where all of our schools are good, where there's more cohesiveness amongst the schools so that kids don't miss a beat going from elementary to middle to high. So it's consistently programming and having teachers talking and working together. And then the third thing is putting our money on teacher development and principal leadership. So it's developing leadership constructs around um, the, the development of uh, teacher leaders. We have an exciting process. We're doing the instructional leadership team development now where we have about 200 teacher leaders from across our 20 schools who on a regular basis are working together, collaborating, visiting each other's classrooms, joint lesson planning, um, talking across schools, um, making school visitations, all in an effort to give teachers voice and give teachers the opportunity to, to take a lead in developing the curriculum take a lead in understanding the change and making the change so we're really excited about that we're getting a lot of traction with that one so I think those would be kind of the three areas for us in West Hawaii that um, are important and these are all supported by the state's race to the top initiatives with the, um, the what we call the pillars the uh, teacher induction mentoring process and the formative instruction using data for the first time in schools we're really using data and making scientific decisions about things and not just because we feel good about it. Yeah. So it's this kind of um, synergy, I think, that's that's um, getting me excited. What about the uh, what about the community? I mean, I've only had passing contact with this, but uh, there are there are certain programs where you bring in, say, business people from outside, say, yeah. from, in your case, uh, Kona, mm -hmm. um, and have them talk to the kids yeah. and tell their stories and try to operate as a kind of a role model. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm I'm a a restaurant owner and his, this is my life you know and maybe maybe the kid gets something out of that has that ever happened yeah <laughs> we're doing more and more of that kind of thing it's happened traditionally a little bit more in the, in the career technical education area but um, um, we're doing an exciting project around a socially development um, uh, values decision-making program called life uh, life plan in the Kalakei complex and we have a partnership with the Hualala Live Foundation and we're doing exactly that where we have mentors adult mentors from the foundation and from the Hualai resorts um, who come up to Kealakei High School and they jointly teach the class with the teachers. And it's about, it's about values clarifications, yeah. ethical decision making, um, decision making life planning. And it's really exciting to see that, that, that community, um, adult community mentor working alongside the teacher with the kids. It's really yeah. exciting work. Otherwise they go through school, they never have contact with people like that. Yeah. yeah. They don't know what to do yeah. when they ultimately yeah. have contact. So yeah. this is great. That's yeah, what really happens from there too, Jay, that's really exciting is that they become mentors, not for that one or two years that they're working with them, but they're there for life. That's the board of directors for these kids. So, you know, when they come back 10 years later, they can still go talk to that guy that, you know, is their coach who's working at the, um, 
Kuala Lumpur Resort. Yeah. So it works. It goes, but, it goes beyond the one meeting. But we're not doing enough of that, you know, and yeah. that's a good isolated example, but um, how do we build a structure we can do that uniformly all the time? Yeah. That's that community school bond. Yeah. Oh, I hope that happens, and more and more. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I see you're so passionate about these things. Yeah. And so, you know, embracing of them. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how life is like for you, I mean, in terms of a career, in terms of the way you spend your day, in terms of the way you see your own future. <laughs> Sorry about that. I, oh, I got blindsided by that question. I don't have a life, man, outside of school. <laughs> no, no. Uh, uh, you know, um, I'll always be an educator. Um, you know, whether I uh, continue working for another two years, five years, ten years, um, you know, once you're an educator, you're an educator for life. So I always see myself in some capacity working with young people or working with community um, um, community concerns. I, I just want to be involved in a, in a, in a helping way. It's, it's that idea of, you know, kinole. Uh, doing the right thing for the right reason with the right people at the right time. Um, I think that's what educators do. I think that's what uh, community activists do. I think that's how we build well places. That's how, we, that's how you have a good life, too. I think so. <laughs> I would hope so, anyway. Yeah. You know, uh, Josh, Josh Green uh, comes around <clears throat> yeah, here. He's, yeah. he's our health care uh, <clears throat> host every Tuesday. And. Um, you know, we talk about um, uh, you know the, uh, the the problem with medicine on the Big Island. You know, have the specialists and all that, and and uh, you know it's that insular drift thing that I mm. mentioned. You know, trying to connect the islands better. But it, it seems to me that the that the, the neighbor islands ought to be a place where people, kids trained in um, you know whatever it is in Oahu, it is UH Manoa, feel that there's a future for them to go to the neighbor islands. And I. You know, I see I see a very nice life. Somebody who gets trained in education, or maybe gets some kind of special pa pass on being able to teach. I don't know if that exists right now, mm. uh, but there used to be something like that. You, you know, you yeah. got you got a, a free degree, uh, and then you could teach. Well, um, no free lunch. Nothing's completely free. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But but the but the Department of Education is is completely aware of that so they're developing our system is developing alternate tracks for certification for teachers and for educators because we see that external perspective is healthy to the system and so the more opportunities that we can provide in that way I think um, it, it, it's healthy and so I think we're looking more to do those kinds of things so yes those opportunities are happening so sort of a return to the yeah. neighbor island a return to the country uh, where you know somebody goes to school say in economics yeah. just picking something uh, in um, you know in Manoa and they said I don't like to teach and I can actually get credentials and I yeah. go and teach and I can go in your area and teach and uh, you know find myself mm -hmm. because to find teaching is to find yourself may I say I uh, think so <laughs> I think so so I mean, that'd be a great career and a great incentive for some some of the kids who come out of Manoa yeah. they can't get a job in Honolulu they can maybe get a job in the neighbor islands you know. well um, if there are folks on Oahu who want to come up and uh, explore the possibility of teaching on the, on the, on, uh, in West Hawaii. Give me a call. Always willing to talk to people. I've got a stack of resumes in my desk that I always keep. You know, always kind of looking for the, the pot of gold there. Okay. So, well, the, the offer is open. How, how can they reach you? I mean, is there a website or something? Yeah, um, they can go to the DOE website and get as much information as they want. Or I can, I can uh, be reached in the West Hawaii District Office at 327-4991. Uh, what a guy. You know, I won't give out my cell, but I'll give my office number. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> you know, it doesn't happen very often that our guests that give their phone number. Three two seven four nine nine one. Give a call. <laughs> Art Sousa, extraordinaire, educator extraordinaire, the area superintendent uh, in West Hawaii, and we're talking about Hawaii education on Hawaii Island, the new education on Hawaii Island here on Think Tech Talks on a given Wednesday late afternoon with Art, who stayed around for us. Uh, on community matters. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jay. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Aloha. Aloha. <laughs>